independent of the Catholic Family Welfare Bureau, but originally I think it was uh, a part of the diocesan operation. Okay. Now, in paragraph 27, you say that the independence of all three elements from the archdiocese is of fundamental importance to you in establishing a system for responding more effectively to victims of child sexual abuse. Do you see that? I do. And is it the case that if in practice that independence of all three elements was not achieved, then the system would be a less effective one than you had intended? Uh, um, I am not aware of the independence uh, uh, of uh, any of these agencies being violated. The question Certainly. was, if I can, Cardinal Pell, if in practice the independence was not achieved, then it would follow, wouldn't it, that the system would be a less effective one than you had attended? That is correct. Now, I take it that you have available to you what we call the tender bundle, Cardinal, that's correct? Uh, I do. And perhaps if the father assisting you can help you turn to tab 11, which is in volume one. Yeah, I have it. That document is headed Appointment of Independent Commissioner to Inquire into Sexual Abuse. That is correct. And you were involved in settling the appointment and the terms of the appointment of the Independent Commissioner? I was. Can I ask you to turn to paragraph 2, Roman numeral 1, which appears on page 5 of that document. To see how Mr O'Callaghan go. And uh, secondly, uh, we never anticipated uh, the volume of responses. Mm -hmm. That would go on for years. Was there any work that you did or you instructed to be done to come to a view as to how many complaints there may be out there who wish to come forward to the independent commissioner? Um, I was aware that there were uh, dozens of uh, complaints that Monsignor Cudmore was dealing uh, with uh, uh, in a, uh, I think, uh, an effective way. Uh, under, under great, great uh, pressure. I was aware of uh, a report in the newspapers and, of course, uh, through my uh, uh, eventual meetings at uh, uh, groups of survivors and uh, victims, that was uh, brought home to me uh, very uh, clearly. And uh, there were groups such as Broken Rights, which were very active. And the presence of those groups and the material they disseminated gave you some indication as to the number of people that might be interested in participating in the Melbourne response? Um, well, with some of those groups, I took uh, what they said with a grain of salt, but nonetheless, there was evidence that uh, something needed uh, to be done to deal with this suffering. Now, can I ask you then to turn to tab 13 of the same volume that's in front of you? Yes. You recognise that document as the four-part plan, as it was then known, which set out the nature and operation of what was to become the Melbourne response? I do. And this is the final version of which there had been a deal of earlier drafts. That's correct? 
Uh, yes, there had been seven drafts, I believe, to my recollection. And uh, yes, this, this is the final version. Thank you. Now, can I turn your attention to paragraph 4.3, which appears on page 5? Yes. You refer there to the establishment of the panel and the payment or offer to pay compensation not being an admission of legal liability. Do you see that? I do. You refer to the term compensation in this paragraph and indeed in the heading. Was it the case that you were of the view that the amounts which were to be paid were indeed compensatory payments? In retrospect, uh, at this stage, whether compensation uh, is the best phrase, uh, I'm uh, quite uncertain. It might have been better headed uh, payments. What do you consider to be the difference between an ex gratia payment and a payment of compensation? <coughs> The ex gratia payments uh, um, excluded factors such as uh, loss of earnings, uh, loss of earning capacity. Uh, often in compensation, uh, there is an adversarial approach so that the facts are tested, uh, so that the degree of culpability of the offences is estimated against uh, other factors. And uh, in the ex gratia payments, um, what uh, was considered uh, was the physical, mental, and spiritual suffering, uh, not uh, uh, the other factors that I have mentioned. Is it the case then, when you use the term compensation, in this first public document indicating the nature and components of the scheme, you were intending that the scheme would indeed compensate people in terms not just of physical, mental and spiritual suffering, but also actual losses they had occasioned as a result of the abuse? No, I don't think that would have been uh, uh, my understanding um, at all because the cap was put at uh, 50,000 and uh, in some cases the loss of earnings uh, might have been more than that. Now, continuing down this paragraph, the second last sentence states that you as Archbishop at the time recognised that there is a strong opposition from some quarters to the making of any compensation payments. What quarters that were you... Is... I'm sorry, Cardinal, there's a slight lag. You were accepting that what I read out is accurate from the document. That's right? I am. What were the quarters from which there was strong opposition? Some uh, people in the church uh, felt that they personally had not been uh, involved and therefore their money should not be used uh, uh, to help uh, the victims, that uh, the money should be uh, taken from the perpetrators. Are you referring to parishioners of the church or officials or office holders within the church? No, I was, refer I was referring uh, primarily to um, parishioners. How did that information come to your attention? Um, I just can't recall whether there were letters, but certainly uh, that point uh, was made to, has been made to me and was made to me, uh, not uh, over regularly, but certainly was made at different times. How did you take into account that strong opposition in determining the components of the Melbourne response? I think you can say I ignored it. 
Well, if we then turn to the next sentence, the compensation scheme takes these factors into account. Do you see that? I do. And those factors included that the Archdiocese and the Church and you did not accept any legal obligation. That's right? Uh, that is correct, for, for the ex gratia payment. And it also takes into account, doesn't it, the strong opposition from some quarters to the making of any payments? It certainly takes it uh, into account to the extent that it was considered and rejected. Now, you then say that the scheme uh, strived to achieve a fair and reasonable compromise. Can you tell the Royal Commission what aspects were compromised in the construction of the Melbourne response? Uh, yes, we, uh, in the Melbourne response, there was nothing adversarial. There was, uh, and uh, be, because of that, uh, it uh, was easier and quicker for the victims to obtain this help. And uh, while we, I have never wanted to say, and I, uh, I hope I haven't, that uh, we only did what other comparable uh, groups did or paid, uh, certainly uh, I myself and the members, the distinguished members of that compensation panel were aware, aware of uh, the contemporary standards of compensation then, and uh, I, our record shows that we were ahead of the curve, that in terms of uh, a deal of, well, I'm not sure there was any other system in Australia, perhaps anywhere else, uh, for this, but with the rough parallels, we were certainly no less generous. You suggest in that last sentence, Cardinal, that a compromise was achieved, which suggests that you achieved in the scheme something less than you might otherwise had if it was not for taking the factors into account in paragraph 4.3. So I ask you again, what was it that you compromised in the scheme that ultimately was introduced? What did you not do that you would otherwise have done without the compromise? Well, the comp one factor in the compromise was that before 96, there had been no settlements uh, whatsoever. The compromise was that it was felt that if there's no adversarial action, uh, that at the compensation hearing, the facts are not disputed, uh, what is not disputed is the percentage of causality of the sufferings. Uh, these were taken in, into account in um, estimating uh, the, uh, the amount to, to, to be paid. I must uh, say, not being a lawyer, I was not closely uh, involved uh, in, these, uh, uh, in the setting up of these, but I was satisfied uh, at that time with the end result. Was the compromise that the cap that was arrived at was significantly less than many people would achieve during a common law claim? And was that compromise reached because of the acceptance by you, the Archdiocese and the Church that there was no legal obligation? Um, another factor, possibly more important, uh, is that many of the people we helped uh, through the compensation panel would have received uh, nothing or very little after going through the courts. Some certainly would have received more and they were free to choose whether they entered into our compensation uh, system knowing there was a 50,000 uh, cap or went through the courts. How did you take into account, Cardinal, that you believed there was no legal obligation to make payments in devising the Melbourne response? 
We did not admit that there was a legal obligation, um, but that in practice, uh, in the compensation panel, we fully accepted our moral responsibility towards those who had suffered. Did you take it into account by reducing the amount that you would impose as a cap on the scheme? Now, I, uh, I was not involved in these uh, discussions. I've attempted to explain uh, the extent to which uh, I participated and understood them. I was uh, satisfied enough at the time. Cardinal. Uh you said you accepted a moral responsibility for those who had suffered. What was the foundation for that acceptance of a moral responsibility? Uh, the establishment of the facts by the independent commissioner. No, I mean, I'm looking for something different. Why was it that you accepted that there was a moral responsibility? Um, because these uh, uh, activities had been committed by officials uh, of the church. It was uh, not a legal uh, conclusion. Uh, there was uh, no uh, decision that if uh, the legal uh, way of dealing things uh, was uh, followed, that uh, we would abandon our common law uh, rights, but uh, it was uh, felt that this compensation panel is only one of uh, uh, one arm of the approach. It was an attempt uh, to lessen uh, suffering uh, and to help these people and to do it uh, quickly rather than have it uh, drag on forever. Or not forever, for a long time. Okay. Cardinal, can I draw your attention to paragraph 4.6, which appears on page 6 of this document? Yes. You see there in the second sentence, there's reference to in the event that a complainant chooses the normal court processes other than the Melbourne response, they should expect that the proceedings will continue to be strenuously defended. Now, was that, I a, do. Was that a view that you held in 1996, that any complainant who took civil action against the church could expect that action to be strenuously defended? Um. I believe that word strenuously was uh, uh, no longer used after 2002 in Melbourne. It's uh, an unfortunate uh, uh, phrase, but uh, I believe that uh, some phrase would need to be there uh, in uh, a non-offensive way, uh, stating that if the matters were taken to court, uh, the church would certainly consider using the defences available to every citizen and organisation in Australia. And in fairness to uh, those contemplating that action, I think that uh, uh, would necessarily be included, uh, but in a less uh, confrontational phraseology. By referring to the fact that the Archdiocese would defend all proceedings, that would satisfy what you've indicated, that is, telling them that they will take the defences available. Wouldn't that be the case? I, uh, you would have to ask a lawyer. I suppose uh, it would. The addition of the word strenuous could be seen to be superfluous. Cardinal, do you have a view on that? Uh, I think I, I would now see it as superfluous. The only circumstance in which it wouldn't be superfluous, if indeed what the Archdiocese was seeking to convey was that complainants should be discouraged from taking 
civil action because the defence would be not merely a defence of the action but a strenuous one? Um, the position of the Archdiocese always was that people could uh, choose this option. We removed those, many of these uh, legal defences and difficulties uh, in our system of uh, compensation. Um, but uh, we did not encourage people uh, across the board uh, to seek uh, uh, compensation through the courts uh, because uh, a lot of them would not have been able to achieve that, to achieve much or any compensation. And the reason they wouldn't be able to achieve much or any compensation was because the structure of the church had the effect of making it very difficult for many complainants to identify the appropriate person to sue. Is that right? That's only one uh, factor. It's uh, a factor which did not enter into the Melbourne response. The other factors in a court of law uh, would be to establish uh, the facts uh, in an adversarial way and uh, to establish uh, just what degree of suffering was caused by the offences. Now, if I can turn your attention to paragraph 6, which appears on page 8 of that document, Cardinal. Yes. There's reference to the Vicar General's office administering the provision of appropriate counselling and support for church persons against whom allegations had been made. Now, did you have, at the time that the scheme was introduced, an idea as to who or what agency would provide that counselling and support? Um, well, my recollections on this are not crystal clear. Uh, obviously, from this, it... Uh, uh, indicates that at that stage the Vicar General's office will uh, provide this uh, counselling. We uh, moved uh, eventually to a, a position uh, uh, well I was uh, all, uh, I, a primary factor in everything that was done was the pressure of work on the Vicar General. It was just overwhelming and impossible. Eventually, we thought it better that the counselling services were offered by an agency um, independent of the Vicar General's office and even independent of the Catholic Family Welfare Bureau. And who or what was that agency? I think it became known as CareLink. CareLink provided services for... Uh, victims or complainants in relation to sexual abuse, did it not? Yes. No, no, that, yes, no I think I, I, I'm in error. Uh, there, there was, uh, I just forget the name of it, another group that was uh, uh, set up uh, to um, help the people in the parishes and uh, uh, explain the situation. Are you referring to the Encompass program, which was established in relation to providing treatment for priests or other religious accused of sexual abuse of minors? No, no, I'm, I'm definitely not. That is another um, arm of uh, uh, help uh, that uh, we offered to uh, better protect people uh, in the future by enabling uh, perpetrators uh, to control their evil uh, inclinations. There, there was uh, another agency uh, which uh, dealt uh, with the pastoral care uh, in parishes and uh, from people uh, affected uh, by these uh, awful developments. Paragraph 6 refers to counselling and support for priests, Cardinal, not victims or others in a parish that might be affected. Do you see that? Um, yes, uh, I didn't uh, read that uh, uh, clearly uh, enough. Yes, that is, uh, that is the encompass, the, the support for priests. 
Now, encompass at some stage... Oh, I'm sorry, Cardinal, had you finished? Uh, no, just I was confused uh, there with the counselling and support for parishioners. At some stage, Encompass had as a senior official uh, Professor Ball, is that right? I believe that is uh, correct, that for some time he was. Now, P Professor Ball was also the person named in this document as providing support services for victims of accused church persons within the Archdiocese, wasn't he? Uh, he was responsible for the oversight and organisation and monitoring uh, of that. So is it the case at this stage that in your contemplation, Professor Ball would provide both counselling and support to victims or oversight of such, as well as counselling and support for church persons against whom allegations had been made? Uh, I, I'm not sure to what extent uh, I was aware uh, of uh, that double role in precisely that way at that time. We'll come back to that, Cardinal. Uh, can I ask you then to turn to tab 22? Uh, this, Cardinal, is a letter from you as Archbishop of Melbourne uh, to a woman who was an early member of the compensation panel. Do you have that in front of you? I do. Now, in this letter, you, in the first paragraph, express to her the hope that the initiatives that is, the three elements of the Melbourne response, will in time heal the hurt of victims, restore the church's credibility, and convince all people of the church's determination to deal with the issue comprehensively in terms of both prevention and cure. Do you see that? I do. Where, where was the cure going to come from? Cardinal? Uh, not from the compensation panel, mm -hmm. but from the counselling services. The counselling... Un... I'm sorry, Cardinal, I interrupted you. Which were unpacked. From the counselling services. Well, the cure, it was hoped, would primarily uh, come from the counselling services, but the cure, there would be a contribution to the cure, of course, from the acknowledgement uh, of the crimes uh, and also uh, through here, through the financial uh, contributions made to victims. So the reference to prevention is a reference to preventing sexual abuse of minors occurring into the future by Catholic clergy and other religious, that's right? Um, where is this reference to prevention? It's in the last line of the first paragraph. Uh, yes. And could, I'm, could I have the question again? I'm sorry. Certainly. The reference to prevention is a reference to preventing sexual abuse of minors occurring into the future by Catholic, Catholic clergy and other religious. Yes. And the reference to cure is a reference, is it not, to curing those accused of or convicted of such crimes? No, well, I thought uh, it was to, he to heal the hurt of victims. So the cure is supposed to be curing the victims rather than the offenders? Uh, that was certainly the intention. You didn't have any system in place at that time which would enable any confidence as to a cure for offenders, did you? Uh, yes, uh, we did. We, uh, uh, well, I'm not sure how confident you can be, but uh, eventually uh, the Encompass, I think it was called Encompass, a system uh, was set up to help priests uh, uh, 
teachers uh, who had been perpetrators uh, to, uh, to do much better uh, in the future. And just when that uh, organization was officially set up was probably a little bit later, but uh, I believe that that work had already started uh, on a case-by-case -case basis uh, at this stage, but I would have to check that. So the term cure was intended to refer to both offenders and victims? Um, no, the cure was uh, uh, to refer mainly to primarily uh, to the uh, victim. Uh, the prevention, I suppose, uh, referred uh, primarily to the removal of offenders uh, from the church, but uh, uh, I uh, did not indulge in such an extended exegesis of these terms uh, at that stage. Prevention by removal the offend of the offenders from the church or prevention by removing the offenders from active ministry? Uh, removing them from active ministry. Because at this time... From church, from, from church activities. Because at this time in 1997, the laicisation of clergy was quite difficult in the absence of their consent, was it not? Uh, uh, almost impossible. Now, just moving down to the third paragraph... you are advising the person who is to become a member of the compensation panel that it will be through the contact of a complainant with the compensation panel that victims will be convinced either to accept the recommended settlement or press on with litigation. Do you see that? I do. Was it your intention that the compensation panel had some advocacy role in respect of its work so as to persuade victims to accept the ex gratia payment rather than take their complaints to the civil courts? Um, uh, no, I would uh, not have seen that uh, as their role, and I think such a role would have been superfluous because the people had chosen to come in before the compensation panel. And it was only if they signed a deed of release that they could not afterwards take any civil action. Isn't that right? Only if they signed the release they I'm sorry, could you repeat? Uh, it's uh, only if they signed a deed of release as part of accepting the settlement, as, as referred to in this paragraph, that they could not afterwards take any civil action. That, uh, that was a consequence of signing uh, the deed of release. Now, just in relation to deeds of release, uh, you refer in your statement at paragraph 89 that you don't recall any specific discussions about deeds of release during the planning of the Melbourne response, but you had a recollection in general terms that they were seen to be standard or necessary, but you can't now recall what advice you received to that effect. Now, Cardinal, the Royal Commission knows that as Archbishop of Sydney, you decided that deeds of release would no longer be required in any resolution of a victim's complaint under towards healing. And you've already given evidence to that effect. That's that right. is correct. Uh, what caused is... you, in your role as Archbishop of Sydney and in following towards healing, to not require deeds when, in 1996, you had required deeds as part of the Melbourne response? Uh... The, uh, the first uh, part of the situation was 
Uh, to the extent that I understood it, I thought it was a normal uh, part uh, of the uh, procedure. Um, secondly, uh, one consideration uh, uh, myself in the removal of the deeds, uh, of the deed of release, was uh, I uh, couldn't imagine uh, myself at any rate as a church authority uh, pursuing somebody who, uh, or objecting uh, forcefully if somebody did not respect the terms uh, of the deed uh, of uh, uh, release. Uh, I can see that uh, uh, some clarification is, uh, might uh, uh, be useful. Um, uh, and it will be interesting, the redress scheme, scheme that the <coughs> Truth, Justice and Healing Council have put forward uh, has, has some consideration uh, uh, of this, but uh, I did not think any useful uh, purpose was uh, served by uh, getting people to sign a deed of release. And of course, in Melbourne, that never prevented anyone from speaking publicly about their situation. And it would be the case, wouldn't it, that if they did take civil action and they recovered money, that money would almost inevitably be reduced by whatever amount they'd been paid under the Melbourne response. Isn't that right? Um, I believe that that is a suggestion from the Truth, Justice and Healing Council. I don't know that, I, I can't recall us ever considering such an hypothesis. But if that is the case, that that would almost inevitably arise, there'd be no question of double dipping, would there? There would be no question of? Double dipping, a complainant receiving amounts of money for the same pain and suffering, as it were. Well, I don't know whether double dipping is the phrase for some people who feel they haven't been sufficiently uh, compensated, uh, but any uh, redress scheme in the future will have to deal with these practical problems. We did in, in this way. We have learnt um, in the process. Just turning to the second page of that letter, if you will, Cardinal. You set out that the other terms of appointment will be that the basis upon recommendations will be formulated, will be subject to the previously announced limit of $50,000 per person. Do you see that? I do. What was your view when you were developing with your advisers the Melbourne response as to whether there should be a cap, leaving aside the amount of it for the moment? Uh, my uh, own recollection uh, to the extent uh, uh, that I have it is that I was uh, um, not really uh, comfortable with that. I acknowledge there would have to be some standards, if that's the word for uh, comparable levels of offences and comparable levels of suffering, but uh, um, uh, one point I might make here to help uh, understand this position of mine, uh, money was never my primary concern. My primary concern was to try to help the victims and I regarded the other arms of the Melbourne response as being uh, more important uh, than this particular arm because uh, many victims then and probably now uh, did not have money as their primary concern. When you say that money wasn't a primary concern of yours, Cardinal, do you mean that the affordability of the scheme was not a concern of yours? 
in that you knew that the Archdiocese would have sufficient funds to cover payments? Uh, I have... Uh, that was likely to be the case. I have said publicly over many years that if necessary, we would uh, uh, borrow the money. Uh, the uh, first uh, criterion uh, was uh, to try to help these people diminish the suffering and do it in a way which was congruent with what was happening in the rest of uh, the country. In fact, uh, in fact, the records will show that during my time in Melbourne and my time in Sydney, those archdioceses were more generous than most other Australian agencies. If it was the case that money was not a concern of yours and affordability of the scheme was not a concern of yours, why place a cap at all? I didn't say it was not a concern of mine. I said it was not my prime concern. I have an obligation or had an obligation as an archbishop uh, to take care of the resources uh, uh, of the uh, archdiocese. Uh, but uh, I was uh, quite clear that uh, we provide what was regarded as uh, appropriate uh, by these uh, very significant uh, figures who were working on the compensation uh, panel. And I don't recall any request from them uh, to uh, vary uh, the cap, at least during my time. Mm -hmm. And I would like uh, also to say that we are talking about 1996. It is, uh, today it is 2014. 50,000 in 96 is variously estimated uh, what it would be worth today, uh, depending uh, on how you calculate uh, the growth. One uh, uh, estimate is that uh, 50,000 then would be worth about 120,000 uh, now. But it's and, the case, uh, isn't it, Cardinal, that now the cap is 75,000 which suggests it might have gone backwards. Well, I would imagine uh, that going from 50 to 75,000 is going uh, forward. I would also uh, suggest that it would be useful to compare that amount that Melbourne offered and is offering uh, with what other agencies, uh, government-sponsored agencies, uh, uh, offer, and I repeat that uh, I myself have never been a fan of uh, um, caps. Now, I think this is a matter that we've dealt with before, Cardinal, but it is the fact, isn't it, that generally government-sponsored agencies <laughs> offers amounts of money for matters that aren't necessarily matters that uh, the government agency is responsible for. To accept that? That government agencies do not pay for <coughs> offences for which they are not responsible. That, in particular, dealing with victims of crime legislation, the government, when establishing such a scheme, makes payments, notwithstanding that the government agency is not itself responsible or, through its officials, responsible for having committed the crimes for which it compensates. You understand that? Well, the prime yeah. Cardinal, can you hear me? Because I'm afraid the line seems to have broken. No, the Cardinal is unmoving on the screen, which suggests it has. Uh, I'm afraid if you can hear me, Cardinal, I'm afraid we can't hear you. Um, there's people pushing buttons here to try and retrieve it.
we do that now. Does your honour want to consider a short adjournment? No, it's coming. Thank you. You want a break? How long will we need? I'm told, ladies and gentlemen, that we will probably need... I'm told we may need another five minutes or so because the line has failed in Rome rather than here. So I think we'll adjourn for five minutes or so and then come back when the lines are established. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.